Hi friends, I'm Max Licato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at maxlucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Licato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. God bless you. God bless you. We're spending time in the greatest verse in the Bible. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There are so many people facing so many challenges these days, so many fears. We really need Jesus. You know, there's none other like him, none other like him anywhere. He is unique in all of history, and he claims to have unique authority, unique authority over all the the challenges that you and I face. Let's talk about Christ as the one and only Son Two of our three daughters were born in the wonderful South American city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We lived in the north zone of Rio, separated from our doctor's office and hospital by a tunnel-pierced mountain range. And during Deanland's many months of, of pregnancy, we made many trips from the north zone of Rio into the south zone of Rio. We never complained. Oh my goodness, what a city. Signs of life. Samba on every street corner. Copacabana and her beautiful beaches. Ipanema and her wonderful coffee bars. Gavia and her glamour. We never begrudged the south zone forays. But I got to tell you, they sure did bewilder me. I kept getting lost. Now I'm I'm directionally challenged already. <laughs> I'm prone to I'm prone to get lost in somewhere between the the bedroom and the bathroom. I mean, I can get lost anywhere. Uh complicate my disorientation with randomly mapped uh streets from a 3 century old urban area and friends i don't stand a chance and of course this was way back before we had smartphones i had one salvation jesus i mean literally the christ the redeemer statue you know how it stands guard over the city 90 feet tall with an arm span of 60 three feet, 1,320 tons of reinforced steel. You know, the head alone measures 10 feet from chin to scalp. (laughs) And it's perched a mile and a half above sea level on Corcovado Mountain. Oh, my goodness. The elevated Jesus is always visible, especially in the south zone, and especially to those who are looking for it. And since I was often lost... I was often looking, kind of like a sailor would seek land. I searched. I searched for the statue. I would peer between the the phone lines and the the rooftops for that familiar, friendly, inviting figure. Find him, and I could find my bearings. Now, John 3.16 offers you an identical promise. This verse elevates Christ to thin air loftiness, crowning him with the most regal of titles, one and only, one and only son. Now, the Greek word for one and only is monogenes. It's an adjective compounded of monos, which means only, and genes or genes, uh, species, race, family, offspring, or kind, 
only genes. When used in the Bible, one and only almost always, almost always describes this parent-child relationship. In the Gospel of Luke, the doctor used it to identify the widow's son. He, he called her the only son of his mother. In chapter 7 and verse 12, the writer of Hebrews used it to describe Abraham. Abraham was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. That's in chapter 11. John uses this phrase five times, and in each case, highlighting the unparalleled relationship that exists between Jesus and God. Let me go down those right quick. The famous one, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of, here it is, the one and only, the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's in verse 14 of chapter 1. One and only. He picks it up again later. No one has ever seen God, he wrote. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Again, that's verse 18 of, of chapter 1. He picks it up in our verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, monogenes, 316, monogenes. And then, and then he, he continues in the same chapter, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Verse 18 of chapter 3. And then he wrote this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live, that we might live through him. That's in the epistle of John, his first epistle, chapter 4 in verse 9. So in three of the five appearances, the phrase, well, it modifies the noun son. And in two cases, it doesn't. The, the son was either from the father or at the Father's side. Monogenes, this is important. This highlights this particular, particularly unique relationship between Jesus and God. Though God is the Father of all humanity, Jesus alone is the monogenetic Son of God because only Christ has God's genes or genetic makeup. The familiar translation, only begotten son, that many of us learned growing up, it really conveys this truth. You see, when parent, parents beget or conceive a child, they transfer their DNA into the newborn. Well, well Jesus shares God's DNA. Jesus isn't begotten in the sense that he began but in the sense that he and God have the same, the identical essence, the same eternal lifespan, the same unending wisdom, the same tireless energy. In fact, every quality we attribute to God, we can attribute to Jesus. So much so that Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He made that declaration. It's recorded in chapter 14 and verse 9. And in the epistle to the Hebrews, we, we, we find an identical statement. Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. That's in chapter 1 and verse 3. In other words, Jesus occupies the peerless, peerless Christ the Redeemer perch. He claims not the most authority, but folks, he claims all authority. He says, my Father has given me authority over everything, over everything. And then he goes on to say, no one really knows the Son except the Father, and no one really knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Underline that scripture in Matthew eleven twenty-seven, And don't hurry through those words. That's pretty astounding. They're either the last straw or the ultimate truth. They warrant deliberate thought. 
Again, Jesus said, my father has given me authority, authority over everything. Does Jesus own the only scepter in the universe? <laughs> well, one follower declared as much. A, a Roman officer sent a message to Jesus asking the teacher to, to come and to heal his servant. So Jesus journeyed in the direction of the soldier's house. But the man sent friends to intercept Christ, intercept Jesus, telling him, don't make the trip. Don't make this unnecessary journey. And here's what he said. He said, just say the word from where you are. <laughs> just say the word and my servant will be healed. I know, he said, because I I'm under authority. I'm under the authority of my superior officers. And he said, I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go or come and they come. And if I say to my servants, do this or that, they do it. That's in Luke 7, verse 7. Now, you see, this officer understood authority. He understood it. When the one in charge commands the ones beneath obey. So the soldier effectively said, Jesus, you call the shots. You call the shots. You inhabit the throne. You wear the five stars on your shoulder. You're in charge. And he saluted Christ. He saluted Christ. He, he bowed before Christ as the supreme commander. And get this, Jesus did not correct him. Jesus didn't dilute the man's opinion. He didn't qualify the man's thoughts. He didn't say, oh, you flatter me. Don't go so far. He could have, but he didn't. He didn't dismiss the adulation because he is the one and only son. He accepted it. He accepted it as appropriate. And he even went so far as to say, I tell you, I've not seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. Christ claims ultimate clout, unshared supremacy. He steers the ship. He pilots the plane. Yeah. I mean, when he darts his eyes, oceans swell. When he clears his throat, birds migrate. He banishes evil. And folks, he can banish a virus with a single thought. He sustains the universe by the power of his command. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He is to history what a weaver is to a tapestry. I remember I watched a weaver once at a downtown San Antonio market. I watched in amazement how she had complete control. She selected threads from her bag. She arranged them on the frame and then on the shuttle. She didn't hesitate. She didn't ask advice. She worked it. She worked the shuttle back and forth, back and forth over the threads. She intertwined the colors. She overlapped the textures. And in a matter of moments, a design appeared. Christ, in like manner, is weaving his story. And every person is a thread. Every moment in history is a color. Every era, whether it be pleasant or difficult, is a pass of the shuttle. Jesus steadily interweaves together the embroidery of history. My thoughts are completely different from yours, says the Lord. And my ways far beyond anything you could imagine. That comes out of the book of Isaiah 55 and verse 8. The root meaning of the word that's translated thoughts is weavings. It's as if God is saying, my weavings are far beyond, far beyond anything you could imagine. During this difficult season, friend, uh, many people, many people are making comments. Comments like, well, no one's in charge, or the world is out of control, or we're spinning into chaos. It may feel that way, but don't believe it. Don't believe it. There is in the throne room of heaven, the one and only son. And he hears our prayers. And in the right way at the right time, 
He will answer and respond appropriately. In the meantime, you just trust Him. You trust Him. Do not live like there is no throne. Or do not live like the throne room is occupied by someone who's confused. Don't think that for a heartbeat, my friend. You just keep turning to Him. And you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son. You put your trust in Him in these difficult days, in what very well may be the final days. God is calling to Himself a people, and He wants you to be among them. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. For more information about Max's ministry, please visit maxlocato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Hello, friends. Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather-soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Locato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at MaxLucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. God bless you. God bless you. We're finding some strength, at least I hope we are, in the greatest verse in the Bible, John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If I only had one verse to share with somebody, that would be it. I love that passage so much that many years ago, it was not that many years ago, a few years ago, I wrote a book about it creatively entitled 316. We need the promise of this passage. Boy, we're facing so many, so many challenges, so many fears. We really need to go upriver of these fears and get our relationship right with God. And according to John 316, we can understand how that happens. Why would God give his one and only son? There's a question. What is it about the death of Christ that means life to you. Now let's, let's answer that by looking at this claim of Christ that he never sinned. When you make a list of the claims that make him kingly or crazy, don't miss this one. He asserted to have the only sinless heart in all of history. Did you know he once invited people? Can any of you convict me of a single misleading word, a single sinful act. That's in John chapter 8. Now, if you ask that question or issue that challenge to my friends and family, you're going to see hands pop up like, like wheat in a Kansas wheat field. But in response to Jesus's challenge, nobody could respond. Nobody spoke up. No one. No one could convict him of a single sin. His enemies had to drum up false charges, remember, in order to arrest him. Pilate, the highest-ranking official in the region, 
took a good look at Christ and said, I find no guilt in this man. Peter, who lived in Jesus' shadow for three years, he recorded the words, he never did one thing wrong. Never. Not once. Not once said anything amiss. Check that verse out. It's in 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. So the standard of Christ mutes all of our boasting by comparison. You know, we don't have anything to brag about. Many years ago, I experienced something remotely similar. I met a golf legend by the name of Byron Nelson. I was brand new to the game. I'd just broken 100 on the golf course. I shot a 98. I was so proud of myself. And about that time, a friend had an appointment with Mr. Nelson, and he asked me if I'd like to come along and meet him. So in route, I bragged about my score, about my double digit score. I offered a whole by whole commentary. And my friend, afraid that I might do the same in the presence of the retired icon, asked me, now, you know who we're about to go meet, right? And you know what he's accomplished, correct? And he began to remind me. He reminded me that Mr. Nelson won five major golf titles. He has a streak of 11 consecutive victories that's never, anywhere, no one's come close to. During that streak, uh, he, his average score was 68. All of a sudden, my 98 seemed very insignificant. The standard of Mr. Nelson silenced me. The standard of Christ silences us. Now, this is a question that's important. How will Christ respond to our sinful lives, our unholy hearts? He's perfect. We are imperfect. Is he just going to pretend we never sinned? Is he just going to gloss over our our rebellion? Is he just going to say boys will be boys, girls will be girls? A holy God cannot do that. A holy God cannot. His his commands are commands. They're not suggestions. Uh, They come from his holy self. And he could not remain holy. He could not be a just judge and not punish our sins. And Jesus made his position clear. He said, anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. He spoke through the Hebrew writer there, chapter 12 and verse 14. Hard-hearted souls will not populate heaven. What heaven is going to be so great because there won't be any curse there, no sin there. It is a pure in heart who will see God, Jesus said, Matthew 5 and verse 8. Well, where does that leave the impure? (laughs) The impure in heart. What do we do? Well, bear with me here. But I want to tell you a word that really helps us. It's the word hyper, H-Y-P-E-R. It's a Greek word that means in place of or on behalf of. New Testament writers repeatedly turned to this preposition to describe the work of Christ. Here's some phrases that you'll perhaps recognize. Christ died for our sins, hyper for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ gave himself for our sins. Galatians 1 and verse 4, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse hyper, H-Y-P-E-R, for us. And Jesus himself prophesied that the good shepherd lays down his life hyper for the sheep, for the sheep. And greater love has no one than this, than that he lay down his life. What's the word you want to guess? Hyper for his friends. Before his death, Jesus took the bread and he explained, this is my body given hyper, given for you. And when he presented the cup, he explained the same thing. This is the cup. He explained, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out hyper, which is poured out for you. Now, Forgive me for sounding hyper about hyper. But the point is crucial. Christ exchanged hearts with you. He placed your sin in himself and invited God to punishment. A passage we've already looked at. The Lord put on him the punishment for all the evil that we have done. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 6. There was a Chinese Christian who understood this point. And before her baptism, a pastor asked a question to ensure that she understood the significance and the meaning of the cross of Christ. And he asked her this question. 
She said, did Jesus have any sin? And she said, oh, yes. <laughs> Troubled, the pastor repeated, making, maybe he wasn't clear. He said, are you sure he had sin? Of course, the lady said. I'm confident Jesus had sin. The leader set out to correct her, but she interrupted him. Not of his own, she said, but he had not. You see, though sinless, Jesus took our sin. Though healthy, Jesus took our disease on himself. And though diseased, we who accept his offer are pronounced healthy. And more than pardoned, friend, we are declared innocent, innocent. We enter heaven, not with healed hearts, but with his heart. It's as if we never sinned. The scripture says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a, a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Praise be to God. 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Is that not the greatest news? You say, Max, yeah, okay. But if I have the heart of Christ, then why is my heart still so rebellious, troubled, anxious? Well, here's the answer. It takes time to get used to your new heart. A heart transplant patient can't run a marathon the day of or the day after surgery. It takes time. The adjustment takes time. Our sanctification takes a lifetime. Salvation takes a moment. Sanctification takes a lifetime, but God will renew your heart. What's important is that right now you believe that when you gave your heart to Christ, he gave his heart to you. When you gave your heart to Christ, he gave his heart to you. It's in there. It's in there. I'm like you. Sometimes I feel like I still got my old heart in me, but that's not true. So let's heed the word and not heed our feelings. There's a new heart inside of you and it's going to come out. It will. You just keep praying. You just keep trusting. You just keep opening the Bible. You keep turning your heart to God. And it's going to get closer and closer, more and more like Him every day. Now, if you've never done that, you can. You can. You can give your heart to Him right now. You do not want to appear before the judgment seat of Christ with your heart. You don't. You don't. It's too stained with sin and rebellion. Let Him give you a new heart. I don't know how much longer we have on earth. I don't. Could be, <laughs> it could be that this pandemic is, is really not the signal of the end times. But boy, I just wonder. I just wonder. Regardless if it is or not, you can give him your heart. And you can begin a new life today. Just say, Lord Jesus, I give you my old heart. I confess to you my sins. And I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, God bless you. Now let me be the first to welcome you into the family of God. Find yourself a Bible and read it. Find yourself a church and attend it, even if only online. A place where you can be baptized, a place where you can belong, a place where you can grow in your faith. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. For more information about Max's ministry, please visit maxlocato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Locato. 
Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at MaxLucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. May God give you strength. May He bless you. May He lift you up, especially those of you who feel like your heart is running on empty. May He give you strength. May He fill you up with His Spirit during these difficult, difficult days. Can we talk for just a moment about the decision to live in the love of God? Jesus urged us, abide in my love. 1 John 4, 16 says simply, God is love. (laughs) The supreme surprise of God's love is that it really has nothing uh, to do with us. You know, others love you because of you, because your dimples dip when you smile, or your rhetoric charms when you flirt. Uh, Some people love you just because of you, but you know, God, not God. He loves you because He is He. He loves you because He decides to love. His love is self-generated. It's uncaused. It's spontaneous. His love is constant. It's a constant level love that depends only on His choice to give it. God is love. So you don't and I don't influence God's love. You cannot impact the treeness of a tree, the skyness, of the sky or the rockness of a rock, nor can you alter the love of God. It is his character. If you could, uh, John would have used more ink on that scripture. God is occasional love or God is sporadic love or God is fair weather love. If your actions altered his devotion to you, then God would not be love. Indeed, he would be loving or human. That's human love. He's divine. And if you, you've had enough of human love, right? Haven't you? Haven't you? Enough tabloids telling you that, that true love is, is just a diet away. Enough helium-filled expectations of bosses or parents or pastors. Enough morning smelling like the mistakes you made while searching for love the night before. Don't you need a fountain of love, a fountain of love that won't won't run dry? Would you accept this invitation of Jesus? He says, abide in my love, John 15, 9. Abide in my love. You know, when you abide somewhere, you live there. You live there. You don't pull in the driveway and ask now, hmm, I can't remember. Where is the garage? You don't have to consult the, the blueprint to find the closet or the kitchen. To, to abide is, is to be at home. To abide in the love of Christ is to make his love your home. Not a roadside park, not a hotel room that you occasionally visit But his love is your preferred dwelling. You rest in him. You eat in him. You sleep in him. When thunder claps, you step beneath his roof. His walls secure you from the raging winds. His fireplace warms you on the winter's night. John said it this way. We take up permanent residence in a life of love. 1 John 4, 17. So what you do is you abandon the old house of false love 
and you move into his home of real love. Now, adapting to this new home takes time. First few nights in a new home, you might wake up and not know where you are. You might wake up and walk into a wall. I did some months back, not in a new home, but in a motel. I climbed out of bed in the middle of the night to get a drink of water, and I promise I walked left. I turned left when I should have turned right, and I flattened my nose. (laughs) The dimensions to the room were unfamiliar. They were different. And the dimensions of God's love are different at first. You see, you've lived a life life in a house of imperfect love. And, and you think God is going to love you like others have loved you. You think he's going to drop you like the boyfriend did or, or abandon you like your father did or judge you like the religion did or curse you like your friend did. He won't. He won't. But it takes time to let your roots go down deep into the love of God and be convinced that he won't. For that reason, just abide in him. Hang on. Hang on to Christ like a branch clutches the vine, right? According to Jesus, the branch models his his definition of abiding. Do you remember this teaching from John 15? As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. That's verse 4 of John chapter 15. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if everyone in the world chose to abide in God's love? How would our world, how would our society be different today, right now, if every single person lived lives drenched, soaked in the affection of the Father? Hmm. So from the file entitled, It Ain't Gonna Happen, I'm going to pull and pose a suggestion. Let's make Christ's command a federal law. I know I'm just teasing. But let's make it a law. Everyone has to make his love their home. Let it herewith be stated and hereby be declared. No person may walk out into the world to begin their day until they have stood beneath the cross to receive his love. Cab drivers, presidents, preachers, tooth pullers, truck drivers, everybody, moms, dads, kids, everybody required to linger beneath the fountain of his favor until they are so joy-filled, so drenched, so soaked, dripping, dripping, like a just-plunged sponge, leaving puddles of love with each step everywhere they go. Then and only then are they permitted to re-enter the world. Only then can they go to classrooms and boardrooms and meetings. Don't you ache for that kind of love? Don't you ache for that kind of change we'd see? Less horn honking and door locking and horn locking and more hugging and helping kids. Well, we can't hug, but we could send our love socially distanced, right? More compliments, more kindness, more forgiveness, more understanding, more heartfelt love. I mean, how can you refuse to give somebody a second chance when God has made your life one big second chance, one big mulligan? Doctors would replace sedative prescriptions with scripture meditations. They might say, now six times an hour, I want you to reflect on God's promise. I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. Can't you imagine the difference? Can't you hear the newscast? Well, since the implication of the love law, divorce rates have dropped. Cases of runaway children have plummeted. And Republicans and Democrats have disbanded their parties. (laughs) And they have decided just to work together. Wild idea? I agree. I agree. God's love cannot be legislated. But friend, it can be chosen. Choose it, won't you? For the sake of your heart, 
for the sake of your home. For Christ's sake, choose it. Hey, this is Dina Lynn Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. For more information about Max's ministry, please visit maxlocato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Hello friends, Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment, Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com. Hi friends, I'm Max Lakato. Did you know that the Bible makes more than 100 references to the Holy Spirit? Jesus says more about this counselor than he does about the church, marriage, finances, and the future. In my new book, Help Is Here, we'll take a deep dive into who the Holy Spirit is and how to access the joy, power, peace, and purpose he offers. Be encouraged. Help is here. Available now at maxlucato.com. Hi, everybody. Max Lucato here from my home to yours. Thanks so much for joining me for today's encouraging word. God bless you. God bless you. We're spending time in the greatest verse in the Bible, John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Boy, we really need Jesus, don't we? We need him because he is, according to John 3, 16, the one and only Son of God. There's none like him anywhere. He's unique in all of history, and he invites us to believe in him. And one reason that millions of people have chosen to do so is this, the miracles of Christ. Let's discuss his miracles. At some point, some low point, we find ourselves hoping beyond hope for a solution, beyond personal resources, longing for a being who is at once unbound and benevolent, a God who is not governed by laws of nature, who is unhindered by weariness, and who is unlimited in his affection for us. We desire, do we not desire, to be released from the rigid train tracks of the predictable, the explicable, the touchable, the measurable, and the tangible. We, we long, we long to believe in miracles. And writers of Scripture urge us to do so. Matthew eight twenty six. Jesus arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. Matthew twenty thirty four. Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. John 6 and verse 19, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. Mark 6, 56, as many as touched him were made well. Verse after verse, story after story, event after event, miracles so numerous, so numerous that were each one occasion to be be transcribed. John, the apostle writer, the gospel writer and apostle said the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John 21 and verse 25. Friend, the, the miracles of Christ were not occasional. They were constant. They, they were not marginal to his story. They were essential. They, they were not peripheral. They were vital activities upon which the very identity of Christ was constructed. Indeed, one of the most compelling arguments 
for the veracity of Christ was the inability of his adversaries to denounce his miraculous deeds. Consider this example. A brief 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, an emboldened apostle Peter began his message to an audience of several thousand people in downtown Jerusalem by saying, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. That's in Acts 2 and verse 22. I like to think that the fisherman turned preacher paused after that last statement letting his words echo off the Jerusalem stone. As you yourselves know, you know, you know. I wonder if he paused on purpose, waiting for one person, any person, just one voice to cry out in disagreement. Did he invite the opposition to, to react, to object? Wait a minute. They could have said, we don't know. We saw nothing. We witnessed no miracles. We witnessed no wonders. We witnessed no signs, but there was no rebuttal. There was no refusal. There were no voices to the contrary. There was instead, at least in my imagination, a nodding of heads, an affirming murmur in the crowd, maybe a shout or two of amen and hallelujah. Many of the people had not only seen the miracles, they had been blessed by them. Can we not assume that some people in the Jerusalem audience were seeing Peter with eyes that were once blind, that they stood on legs that were once crippled, that they lifted healthy hands that before Christ had been marred and scarred by leprosy. You see, no adversary countered the claim of Peter because no adversary could. The reason that there were 3,000 people who responded to Peter's altar call was not because his sermon was so eloquent, but because the ministry of Christ was so powerful. Case studies were sprinkled throughout the audience. Friend, would you, would you be open to the idea of a miracle working Christ? You see, a miracle, it's, it's a work of God, wrought by God for a godly purpose. Miracles are, are these shoulder taps from God, whispers or even sirens reminding us, you're not alone. I'm still in charge. And my dear child, my plan will be achieved. Miracles remind us that there is more to this life than meets the eye. God bless you, my friend. Hey, this is Dino and Lakato. Max and I are so thankful you joined us for today's encouraging word. Please subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss a single message. For more information about Max's ministry, please visit maxlocato.com. Until next time, stay encouraged. Susan here with Team Locato. We're excited to announce a fresh take on Max's best-selling 365-day devotional, Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition. Each page of this beautiful leather soft edition has plenty of room to pen your own prayers and insights. You can order your copy of Grace for the Moment Note-Taking Edition now at maxlocato.com.